Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show right here on the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you over with us as always. You know, as I watch Biden win this election, I started to think about how the United States has been for the last 20 years in war in Iraq, Afghanistan, with no end in sight. Now, Biden will be the fourth president to preside over those wars, the fourth and now with his national security appointments, his choice of secretary of state, the revolving door between the defense industry and national security positions in his administration, in every administration, and his history of support for these wars, will they ever end? And these occupations never work out, and they never end well, whether they're in our inner cities or in the streets and villages of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, wherever they are. Remember Vietnam? That didn't work out so well either, did it? So what can we expect? We once again, we return to a man who taught and graduated from West Point, who led troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, whose website's name, the Sept Skeptical Vet, I think says it all. Dennis Adjurson, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Well, thanks for having me. It's always uh, it's always a great conversation. Good to have you here. And, so, and let me add that Danny has a new book coming out called Patriotic Descent, America in the Age of Endless War. And when we get a copy of that book, we'll be talking to him about that. But now we're talking to him about where we're going as a country. And my sense is when reading the last few things you wrote, Danny, is that um, you're not feeling terribly optimistic about where we're headed. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I want too. to. Right. I mean, there, I mean, there are people uh, there, there is a sense, you know, social media is a toxic environment, you know. And so uh, the other day, someone labeled me on social media as a blue MAGA, <laughs> right? like blue Trump, because I'm critical of Biden's team. And honestly, I'll admit, like, I was impressed by that level of trolling. But, you know, I think the point here is that um, I'm so glad Trump is gone. I wish we could stop talking about him. Um a lefty, I guess, vaguely. Um, but I do think that there's a need to call out indecency and inconsistency, cons inconsistency wherever we see it. And so there are aspects of this Biden, you know, foreign policy that have bothered me. And there's really two that are like really on my mind. So if, if anyone follows like what I write or anything, you know, Afghanistan, it looks like the Biden team might stick around for a while. And then just yesterday and the day before, you know, NATO is doubling down on its Iraq commitment. And and the Biden administration is thinking about maybe uh, stay, not just staying, but maybe escalating a little. And, and all I can think to myself is it's interesting that Iraq is back in the news because no one's even talked about Iraq for years, like years, it seems, you know. And um, in other words, these wars have been ongoing, but in an invisible fashion. And so my skepticism about it or, or my lack of, you know, uh, optimism about this administration is that these wars that no one's paying attention to are going to continue with an inertia all around. I want to come to that part about not paying attention to these wars. Not, but let me, let me stick for a moment with the Biden administration to get some thoughts here. I mean, when you look at some of his appointments, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, you got Jake Sullivan, uh, and Victoria Nuland as Defense Secretary. I don't know much about Lloyd Austin, who's the new uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, retired general. Um, you've got Kirk Campbell, who is this mm -hmm. anti-Chinese uh, ideologue. Um, and, and so, I mean, th this, this, his team says a lot about what could happen and, and could actually buoy, unfortunately, what you're, what you're saying could be where we're face what we're facing. I mean, it's the same old people. I mean, this is, this is a status quo squad for a status quo job. Uh, here, here's how I know things are kind of through the looking glass. I mean, Biden, as you mentioned, has a, a really problematic record on foreign policy. It's not all awful, but mostly he's been kind of a hawk, like a liberal hawk, you know, like a Harry Truman. And I'm in this situation now where I trust Biden, like his gut, because he's a gut player. He'll tell you that. I trust his gut more than hmm. his people, because oftentimes personnel is policy. And if you didn't believe that personnel is policy, then George W. Bush, Exhibit A, right? I mean, look who he surrounded himself with. So what we've got in the Biden administration in many cases is the arsonist put in charge of the fire brigade. It's the people who under the Obama administration did Yemen, did Libya, did Syria, none of which has worked out, that have been put back in charge. And I actually trust Joe Biden's gut more than them, because even though he's inconsistent, take Afghanistan. In the Obama administration, Joe was the competent voice, or at least the reasonable voice he said the surge won't work. 
I'm not sending my son back there to fight for women's rights because it won't work. Um, and I trust that more. But unfortunately, he's got Jake Sullivan, you know, the White House is like resident Jafar from Aladdin, like, you know, speaking in the Sultan's <laughs> ear. And I don't trust this guy. I mean, I've written a lot about him. He's a little bit of a blind spot for me, admittedly, but I've studied this guy. I mean, it's not just him, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a number of people who are retreads from the Obama administration. And the Biden bro archetype or sis is this, you know, Ivy League school, uh, worked for a congressman on their staff, mid-level role in the Obama administration in a relatively hawkish position, and then leaving there and going to a think tank funded by the defense industry and a consulting firm that works in the military industrial complex prior to coming to Biden. And, 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 and every single one of his senior national security picks fits that mold. And if you say it, there's a lot of polite liberals who will say, oh, you know, what do you like, Trump? And, and I just think that that whole concept is dangerous. We have to be clear that we're, we're, we're able to be critical of even, like, you know, quote, our own. So but they take, they take it from a different perspective, an outside, outside of the government, outside of this country perspective. I was thinking about conversations that I had with a, a, a good friend of mine who is named Tabat Abdullah, who's a professor in Canada. He's from Iraq. Um, he opposed Saddam. He opposed the invasion. He had to flee Iraq under Saddam. Um, he was imprisoned by Saddam. Another friend of mine is Kayum Karzai from Afghanistan, who's actually the brother of the other Karzai. We, we call him the good Karzai. Right. <laughs> um, they, but they both said something interesting in my conversations with them about these wars. And they both opposed these wars. Um, but they also said, okay, so the United States and the West comes into our countries. They tear us apart, tear our societies asunder. Um, and then you leave. And leave us with what? So how do we respond to that? How do we respond to the responsibility that we have to the countries that we tore apart in these wars? Mm -hmm. As much as we want to get out of these wars, what, what what would be your response to that? That's a response that I work through. You know, we talked before the show about, you know, staying up at night because there's some issue in your brain. You know, a certain kind of person does that. Um, that's what keeps me up at night. You know, I sound more confident in my articles <laughs> than I am which is to say that there are a lot of nights where I'll say, okay, I've been advocating to withdraw from Afghanistan, for example. But I do not take lightly the fact that the Taliban pursues a monstrous agenda. Um, and so I, I think on this and, you know, and, and in all these situations, but then I'm reminded of, of, of this. This is where I come down on that. The, um, if you... There is a misunderstanding that American military policy can measurably move the needle on these societies. And an empirical analysis shows that American intervention has actually tended to be counterproductive in terms of, you know, creating more terrorists, you know, uh, building up nationalist, you know, anti-American sentiment that then aligns itself with Islamism because there's always this notion that, as social scientists say this, that in any sort of chaotic situation, there's an extreme disadvantage. In other words, the most extreme elements get empowered in a chaotic, like civil war situation. So I, I'm not, we'll take exact Afghanistan as an example. I am not convinced that 2,500 American soldiers or 4,000 or 6,000 or whatever the number we come down on can actually make a difference. Uh, so in the end, at that point, it, it, what we need is that, like sort of Afghan solutions to Afghan problems. Now, I'm not convinced that those are going to happen. But I'm not, but I am sure that staying for one more year, two more years, 10 more years, there will be no change on the ground because of our presence. And so I'm not comfortable with any of that. You know, I've seen the indecency. I've seen the way, I mean, the final anecdote, like there was a, there was a, a little girl, I mean, there was like an 11 year old, 10 or 11 year old girl that I sort of like, you know, I just, I just fell for her in Afghanistan. I had a little boy that I hadn't mm -hmm. seen for a year. Um, maybe it's ridiculous, but she was, she was, she had like these blue eyes and she was like really sassy. I used to bring her toys. Like I would secretly bring her extra candy when I go to the village. And one day mm. she disappeared. She disappeared. She just wasn't there. I went to this village every day. You know, sometimes we get attacked, sometimes we wouldn't. And I said, where, what happened? And I was panicking. I thought, well, maybe she stepped on an ID or something that happened, you know, because I, Taliban would bury a bomb and a slave would step on it. And then one of the village elders said, oh no, like she had her thing. So that's that. And what they meant was, you know, she had had her first 
you know, woman like menstruation. And so they, you know, cloister her and I'll never see her again, you know, because she'll marry some older man. And so in other words, the reason I tell that story is because like, I don't take lightly the fact that America's absence, you know, in some sense empowers that. But I think that if we're going to be sober strategists, we have to ask the question, did American military policy cause some of these problems? Uh, did it catalyze them or make them worse? And can continued American presence fix that? And if the answer is no, then I think we have to sort of like pull some of that emotion out when we make policy. And that's basically my So, I mean, I think when you think about those things, you also just wrote this piece on, on, on AFRICOM, on the, on the U.S. Africa Command. Um, I think for Tom Dispatch, if I remember right, right? So um, and I was thinking about that. When you, when you think about most Americans are not aware of this war. I mean, it's different. Like in Vietnam, people were aware because mm -hmm. your ass was getting drafted. So people, and, and, and most right. everybody that I knew, knew people who died in Nam or were getting, everybody got drafted, you know, my number came up and all that stuff happened. So, mm -hmm. um, so people were involved, but now you don't see an anti-war movement in this country of any, of, of everything to speak of. You have small demonstrations here and there. People are not aware of this war, of, the, of what's really going on in Afghanistan or Iraq. No, nothing about what we did in Libya. Nothing about how we're involved in Somalia, let alone being thinking about the African command where we're getting knee deep with the French wars in in the in all these nations in the West West Africa that they used to colonize, French is colonized. So I mean, so this situation that we're facing now, it's almost difficult to get people to focus in on why we should not be involved when nobody even gives a crap because nobody's even aware that we are involved. You know, I, I don't think that I'm being a conspiracy theorist when I say that part of the problem is that this is by design. In other words, if you if you make war an abstraction, an abstraction, invisible, how do you do that? Well, you, you turn on tech-savvy solutions, you use proxies, you use militias, maybe some special forces raids, drones. Then American casualties go down, right? There's no draft, so the people aren't expected to be in the military. But even the professional military, I mean, Look at, I mean, the casualty counts. When I was in Baghdad in 2006 and seven, we were losing 100, 120 Americans a month in Iraq. I mean, you remember those days very well, but when I talk to people who are young, they don't even remember that, you know? Hey, if you lose two American soldiers in the various wars in a month, that's a, that's a lot. But the interesting thing is we're still killing at crazy rates, right? Sanctions, bombing, all of that. Africa is interesting because it is like the, proving ground for this new form of warfare. And uh, I used to watch Bill Maher back in the day, not so much anymore. He used to, you know, I, I used to enjoy him. He made me laugh, especially during the Bush years, you know. And, uh, and he always has this segment, new rule, right? New rules, you know. Well, here's a new rule. If the majority of Americans can't pronounce or find the name of a country that American soldiers died in on a map, then we shouldn't be there. And I'm talking about Niger, right? right? And mispronouncing Niger is a problematic, right, situation. But, you know, in 2017, four Americans died in Niger. You know, no one can pronounce it, no one can find it on the map. And, and you mentioned how things were different back in the day. Well, you know, my grandfather, maybe your father, were in World War II. What percentage of Americans could pronounce and find Japan and Germany on a map? A lot, right? Maybe 90%. And yet what we've done is we've made this kind of war invisible, the outcomes of which are no less warfare-like. I mean, a Yemeni child that starves because they didn't get the morsel they needed or gets bombed by the Saudi Air Force that we used to refuel and we still pay for their bombs, it feels like a war to them. But for the American people, because their sons and daughters aren't going to the war and there's no war tax, at least not directly, it, it becomes invisible. And, and I literally just signed a book contract this week to write a, a book called The New Barbarians about this war as an abstraction and why I think it's really problematic. And this is what you're kind of mentioning. I, I, we don't talk about this enough, is my point. So yeah. what do you think that leaves, I mean, uh, how do we get that understanding? You know, I was thinking, one of the things I was thinking about this morning before I think about our, our conversation today was, um, what would what would Danny's suggestion do if he was the national security advisor? If he was, <laughs> would he probably wouldn't take the job to start with, but just, it just, play the game if you were there. I right. mean, and, and when you realize that this is where war is going, that, that, that we mm -hmm. are backing away from kind of full combat and now it is drones. Now it is these, these incursions. It's almost like 
a horrendous twist on how Vietnam started with U.S. Special Forces advisors, you know, and and not a full blown war. Uh, but we may be in that mode forever now. I mean, this could this could be the way the United States gets involved. How we confront China and Africa. How we confront China anywhere on the globe. I mean, this could be this could be the new war. This could be the new normal. Absolutely. I mean, I, I one of my articles for I, I, the last two that I wrote for Tom Dispatch were basically kind of on this subject, you know, of like war, the future of warfare. Um, first of all, I would take the job, probably <laughs> not from Trump. If Biden offered me the national security advisor, I'd probably take it. You know, everyone has a price. Mine's high, but I'll take it. No, but I, I the reason I would, it, you know, I would, I think, and it's not like a me thing. I mean, there are people more qualified than me, but I would love to see a national security advisor or a secretary of defense, right? The war side, what we should really call the war department, right? right. What you, we used to call that. Come in and say, uh, my job is to protect America, to protect national security. And then say, the best way to protect national security is to not fight wars and to focus on the real threats, which are, you know, climate change, pandemic, economic insecurity, and all this, and then kind of reorient the entire question and philosophy of what defense is. Because we're stuck in a 20th century, mid 20th century, you know, definition of national security. And it doesn't apply because, you know, aircraft carriers and tanks cannot fight the real existential crises that America's facing. And, and I do think that it's, you know, important that we recognize that. And a lot of folks are stuck in that box where, you know, when a, when a secretary of defense comes in, the assumption is they should just be making our military as powerful as possible. And if they don't, then they're not patriots, right? And they, and, and they're, they don't really care about our security. But what if, and no one ever talks about this, what if having the most powerful military in the world, they can't win a war, by the way, you know, hasn't won a war since right. World War II, really, right. like a meaningful war. What if spending the money on that is itself increasing our insecurity. No one ever really talks about that because it's not comfortable, but I, I think that you know we need someone to come in who would say that, which is why when, when Bernie looked like he was gonna win for a moment before everyone flipped in a week, you know, and like came out of the race, and there was this article that came out, I think in Politico, and it listed who his cabinet would look like, and Andrew Basevich, you know, my friend and colleague, who I, you know, was my muse 15 years ago when he would never even known who I was, was listed as a potential candidate for Secretary of State. So forget me, I'd like to see Andrew Basevich come in there, who went to West Point, served in Vietnam, was a colonel, knows how to do the military, but has is astute enough to say that the military can't solve our security problems. So we need to reframe the whole thing. So I will say Andrew Basevich for National Security Department. All right. There we go. Mad, there we go. But now we have a situation which you touched on a little bit as well here, which is that there is this revolving door that has not changed between the defense industry and national security appointments across everybody's administration. And as and generals taking over the, the, the defense department, as all these generals were inside of Trump's White House. I mean, so the, the, it's almost an insidious thing that's going on here that makes it impossible to change the dialogue conversation, let alone the policy. I, uh, I wrote a piece for antiwar.com uh, a few months ago called Where Are They Now? And I, I sort of laid out all the generals and colonels that I served under in Afghanistan. And, and what I describe is what are they doing now? Well, they're all in the military industrial complex in some way if they've retired. You know, that's at the mid to lower level. But the Biden administration is, you know, look, is it preferable to the Trump people? In many ways it is. But these people work for Raytheon or they work for, you know, strategic consultancies that are funded by the defense industry or do work in national security. And so I actually think that it's an insult to uh, the progressive movement to say that we don't have better options, because we do. There are folks who know this business, who, who understand the policy, who aren't tied to Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. And I think we need to give up on this idea that if, if someone's a professional, that means they must have worked for the military industrial complex. Because you're right, I mean, the revolving door creates a cycle whereby how can we expect people to oppose war and oppose an arms race, like forever defense budgets growing, who has a pecuniary interest in those same corporations? And, uh, and I think we have to call that out and not be 
assumed to be Trump supporters or, uh, you know, apologists for the right, because that those two things are not. You the know, same. I was thinking about this, and people don't think about this either. I think a lot when I think about the wars that we that we're in now and where they came from. I mean, think about nine eleven. We people have amnesia. We forget that that. Osama bin Laden was created by our intervention to overthrow a communist government of Afghanistan, government of Afghanistan, to create the Mujahideen that he came from, that create that attacked, then attacked the United States in 9/11. That that and our response was to create this war in Afghanistan. I mean, it, it, that we we forget our own history. You know, you you alluded to the fact that the other, not alluded, you you mentioned in one of your articles, you know how we didn't take lessons from the other 20 year war that never ended in the Philippines, only even thinks about that war from the early part of the 20th century, right? I mean, so there's somehow that understanding of our history and getting that fervor alive in terms of what we've done with these wars, how many trillions of dollars we have spent in the last 20 years uh, at, in, instead of investing in our own country and ending poverty and dealing with racism, we spend on these wars. I mean, people, those connections have to be met, but somehow they have to be made in a popular way. How do you see that happening? Well, so I want to say something about yeah. the Philippines quickly. And I, and I know that that may seem like an esoteric like diversion, but you mentioned at the start of the show that Biden is the fourth president to helm these wars. Well, you know, Vietnam also had four presidents, but if you look at actual combat troops in combat, really the only other example of four presidents helming a war is the Philippines, 1898 to 1913. So you've got... Um, McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Taft, and then Wilson. And, you know, that's where we piloted waterboarding, right, which we have we now have heard about under the Bush years. Uh, one of the lieutenants who served there in 1912 and 1913 was a guy named George Marshall. And George Marshall, of course, goes on to lead the American military through World War II kind of brilliantly. And uh, so he served in the 15th year of that war. And then when he was Secretary of State, he said that he didn't think a democracy could weather or fight a seven years war. And so I think that we have to take very seriously this idea that empire comes home and that if a state or a republic fights a 20 year war like we are now, that there's going to be ramifications and sort of like a disease that affects the republic. So that's civil liberties, that's institutions. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now, uh, not just the capital riot, but just like the general troubles in our republic and our civil liberties and our suppression of you know whistleblowers and journalists um this is this is not new this is what happens when war and empire come home and if you don't believe it then just ask the portuguese the french the british or any of the imperial countries and how they were affected when you know from 1960 to 1975 when about 40 nations got their independence from those empires there was a major effect at home in those capitals in the metropole. And I will close with this. I mean, I think that, that you kind of really pointed that out as well. Another piece that you wrote where you connected the occupation of our inner cities and the militarization of the police in the inner cities and quoting stuff from the wire um, that took place in Baltimore. And, and that's, a, that's a, that, that is a direct connection to what you're describing here in terms of the absolute oppression that goes on in the poorest communities of our country with the militarized police. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, after George Floyd, when I was doing my tiny, tiny, you know, activism role, you know, I was in Kansas City for, you know, 25 or so out of 30 days, just, you know, in the streets, I would sleep in my car. Sometimes I go to these protests and just put my body there. You know, I didn't do anything special, but I would write about it. And one of the things I said was that when I saw the tear gas, when I saw the militarist police and they had snipers on top of department stores and they had drones above us, I said, you know, it is a situation today where uh, Kansas City looks like Kandahar. And, you know, Baltimore looks like Baghdad. And of course, I was, you know, playing on alliteration, but I, it was more than that. You know, I think that one of the silver linings of this protest movement after George Floyd is that what it showed us is that the empire really has come home. The police outed themselves as this militarized entity. And that's more than the 1033 program, the cosmetic sharing, you know, of, of body armor and, and armored vehicles. It's a culture of militarization. And that's why I brought the wire in because, you know, as they say in the wire, if you call something a war, then everyone starts acting like warriors. And I think that actually ultimately what we'll regret more is the 
uh, social sort of militarization of the police, the culture of warrior policing, that will actually end up being more problematic than the armored vehicles or the body armor or, or the drones. Well, Danny, suggestion it's always great to talk with you. I mean, it, uh, I could we could do this another hour and a half, but then it wouldn't air it, be too long. So, <laughs> yeah. well, but it's been great. And yeah. I look forward to your book, Patriotic Descent. Uh, I look forward to talking many more times. So thank you so much for, t for uh, joining us today once again. Oh, always thank you. Always you a pleasure. On. That was Daniel Sudersen and I'm Mark Steiner. You're here for the Mark Steiner Show on the Real News Network. I want to thank you all for joining us. And please let us know what you think. Write to me here at across the bottom, mss at therealnews.com. And don't forget, while you write, think about making a donation to the Real News. And just go to therealnews.com forward slash donate and make that donation to keep these kind of conversations rolling. So as I said, I'm Mark Steiner for The Real News. Take care.